Thank you for coming to the Bradley for breakfast this morning. We get started on our, our final day of conference. Uh, my name is Jeff Malcolmson. I'm the photo archives manager for the Montana Storm Society. And can everybody hear me back in the back? That's all right? Good. You can all right. the mic up too. Okay, yeah. All right, I am going to tell you a little bit about uh, the Bradley Fellowship uh, before we get started and introduce Patrick, our speaker, this morning. Um, I also want to uh, point out that we have uh, valuations in your, uh, your folders. You might have seen those already, but we really appreciate you uh, evaluating the conference, giving us some feedback. Uh, so if you can get through this by the end of the day, uh, turn it into any of the staff at the, the table or anywhere at any of the sessions. Um, we'll get those back to the folks who uh, can take that feedback and make some improvements for next year and into the future. So we can value your, your information. Um, so the Bradley Fellowship uh, is something that we've been doing for a long time uh, at the Research Center, which is the Library Archives and Photograph Archives. Uh, and it's named after James Bradley, uh, who was an early uh, historian, uh, served in the military here in Montana, and he, he died at um, the Battle of Big Hole. But he, uh, his, his memory kind of lives on through this fellowship. Uh, we offer um, a stipend, enough stipend to bring uh, researchers in so they can spend weeks uh, researching in, in our facility and then generally write an article for the magazine or, or do some other other work. Uh, we have a couple other fellowships as well uh, at different times. So uh, if you want more information on the Bradley Fellow Fellowship, you can look it up on our, our webpage. I'll direct you there uh, under the Research Center and Fellowships. So, um, so without further ado, let me get to our speaker. Uh, Patrick Coney is uh, coming to us from Nebraska most recently. Let me just uh, read you his, his introduction here. Uh, Patrick Coney re received his bachelor's and master's degree in history from Colorado State University. Um, and is presently... Yes, Rams. Go Rams! <laughs> I did too, but I don't mind asking. So. Rams stick together. Uh, and, and is presently finishing his PhD in history at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His dissertation explores the human linkages uh, that bound together a sequence of seemingly unrelated episodes of extra-legal collective violence between 1840 and 1865. His recent publications include In the Union, There is Strength, Claim Clubs, The Law, and the First Murder Case Brought to Court in the Nebraska Territory in Great Plains Quarterly, and um, Murderous, Unwarrantable, and Very Cold, Mapping the Rise of Extra-Legal Killing in the United States, 18, uh, 1783 to 1865. That's in the Journal of Digital History. His digital history project, RiotX, at riotx.org, explores and visualizes over 2,200 incidents of extra-legal collective violence between the revolution and the end of the Civil War. So let's welcome Patrick Hunt. Thanks, Jeff. Can everyone in the back hear me okay? Am I holding this at an appropriate distance? Great. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to offer another word of thanks again to the amazing folks at the Montana Historical Society um, it was through their, their interest, their support, and their generosity that I'm able to be here today speaking with all of you. Like Jeff mentioned, I uh, was lucky enough to win a Bradley Fellowship two summers ago, and the, the weeks I spent in the archive in Helena are foundational to the talk I'm going to give today here. Um, it was also the foundation for an article recently published in the, the, the magazine, um, and it's becoming an integral part of my dissertation, which will, fingers crossed, be done here in May. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> One quick point of order I want to make before we get started here. I'm going to be referring to the region that we now know as Montana, simply as Montana or as territorial Montana. Uh, for much of the period that we're talking about today, this is actually technically part of territorial Idaho still. Uh, but for ease of reference and for ease of understanding, I'm just going to refer to this area as Montana. So uh, with that out of the way, let's begin. And we're going to begin, as so many uh, stories of murder and mayhem do, on a cold, dark December night. Uh, <laughs> specifically, the night of December 20th, 1863, when eight men gathered in John Nye's dry goods store in Virginia City. Secrecy was paramount, 
Uh, Nye attempted to, to cover the windows by hammering up sheet iron, and when this apparently failed, uh, the men contented themselves with dousing the lights and speaking in hushed tones. Um, gathered in that, that clandestine council were Wilbur Fisk Sanders, Paris F. Fouts, Nicholas Wall, John Creighton, Alvin Brookie, Frederick Root, John Nye, of course, and John S. Lott. Six of those men, Creighton, Lott, Nye, Fouts, Root, and Wall, were merchants. Sanders, for his part, was the prosecuting attorney in an ongoing murder trial. And these men were concerned. Um, Recently, uh, the, a young employee of a local merchant had been found robbed and murdered, his body moldering in a field. Um, eventually, another young man named George Ives was arrested for that murder and put on trial uh, for want of the formal legal system he had established in the area in front of a, a minor's court. Uh, that was the trial in which uh, Wilbur Fisk Sanders was uh, currently operating in. But the proceedings of a minor's court wasn't enough for these eight men that gathered in Nye's store. They, they wanted and they needed something more uh, decisive. So whispered plots swirled in that cold, dark December air. And by the time the evening was through, the men had formed a committee of vigilance. And an unprecedented campaign of killing was about to commence. Now, I'm sure most of you here are familiar with the basic cadence of the vigilante story from here. Over the weeks that followed, these vigilantes and the men who joined them killed at least 21 men, including the local sheriff, Henry Plummer, who the vigilantes insisted was the leader of a rabid pack of highway bandits, or what they referred to as road agents. The, the, um, that, that campaign of killing would enter into the, the stuff of legend, um, especially here in Montana. I know that vigilante iconography adorns the patches of state patrol troopers. The vigilante is the mascot of at least one Helena area high school. And of course, vigilantes and vigilantism constitute an important part of local tourism in many places. And it's not just mi Mo uh, Montana where the vigilante myth is celebrated. It's entered into more broadly the, the pantheon of the, the so-called Wild West more generally. Now there's a reason for that. There's a reason why this, this, this legend became so quickly entrenched. And it's because of the work of the vigilantes themselves, the men who knew him. So as you can see here, just two years after the end of the killing, they're already throwing grand balls for the, the, the benefit of the Vigilance Committee. So there was work done pretty rapidly to sanitize um, and create the, this legend out of this, this killing campaign. Um, but perhaps the most influential work done in creating the Vigilante legend was the work penned by the likes of Thomas Dimsdale, and Nathaniel Langford, and others who knew many of the Vigilantes uh, personally and who crafted narratives that, that, um, that portrayed the violence in fairly stark terms, as a, a battle between good and evil, with the reluctant vigilantes on one side moving to perform violence against these anarchic, plunderous, and murderous bandits. In this legendary retelling, or in the Dimsdale and Thankford narratives, the primary motivation behind the violence and behind the vigilantes' action is this, this uh, overwhelming desire to combat lawlessness. And, and that desire is really what fuels the violence and what propels the vigilantism forward. Now, I'm here today to share a slightly different narrative of this 1863 to 64 vigilante campaign in what is now Montana. And my argument today is gonna to consist really of, of two interlocking parts. First off, we're gonna talk about the motivation of those vigilantes. And as I'm gonna argue with you here today, it, lawlessness was a tertiary concern for many of these men. Above all else, they were interested in protecting their lives and their property. As we're going to see, the overwhelming majority of the vigilante leadership and membership, indeed, was composed of merchants. And uh, as we're going to uh, see as we work through the, the cycle of mercantile efforts in what is now Montana, we'll see that highway banditry and the work of the road agents posed an acute threat to merchants in particular and sort of was the impetus behind this move to violence. Building from that is the second part of this conversation, which is uh, how this group of merchants was able to orchestrate such a ruthless and large-scale killing effort that had no precedent in American history up to this point. When we think of folks that can organize this sort of campaign, you don't really think of merchants as a group of killers. Um, but as we're going to find out, uh, these men were not greenhorns when it came to this kind of violence. They entered into Montana already possessing a wealth of experience from protecting their lives and their property in other areas in the years prior. Uh, 
and other violent property disputes. And we're going to dig into those human backgrounds, experiences, and networks to see how those other episodes of violence and vigilantism connected what happened in Montana to this vast constellation of violent action elsewhere in the United States. If we're able to understand the violence in this way, it helps us not only better understand what happened in Montana that winter, but to better understand the form and the mechanics of extralegal violence in the United States more generally. So we're going to begin, as so many stories of the vigilantism do, with gold. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, a prospector discovered gold in the summer of 1862 at Grasshopper Creek. The news of that find spread like wildfire, and a flood of miners soon moved into the area. There, they established a mining town that they named Bannock, after the indigenous Bannock people. Um, I believe this is a, a hand-drawn map of Bannock I found in the archives that I, I love quite a bit. Um, in the spring of 1863, another group of prospectors found gold um, some 70 miles east of Bannock. There was another uh, stampede of miners to that area where they established the mining town of Virginia City. Uh, they initially attempted to name that settlement Verena in honor of Jefferson Davis's wife, but a unionist miners judge uh, put an end to that pretty quickly and changed the paperwork to name the city Virginia. These mining towns quickly swelled with new settlers. Uh, who were drawn to the area by the allure of gold, but also by a desire to escape the turbulence of the Civil War. Um, many of them still carried their, their partisan sympathies with them into Montana, um, especially the Missouri men who are frequently referenced in their writings as are proudly and boldly proclaiming their, their secessionist sympathies. So the joke at that time um, was that such men constituted the left wing of Confederate General Sterling Price's army, because even though they talked a big game, they left. The mining towns quickly swelled, and soon Virginia City alone was twice as big as Denver at the same period, with about 5,000 residents. Um, this was an incredibly rapid population explosion, mostly of young men. And as you can imagine, uh, this led to some problems. Uh, first of all, the migration had happened so rapidly that the, the federal government was not able to establish the formal legal system in the region that could handle with the tensions, uh, the disputes, and the crimes that would uh, accompany this, this massive movement of human beings. But even more immediately, there were logistical problems. Uh, these many thousands of men had suddenly descended upon this area uh, with such speed that there was no local agricultural or manufacturing infrastructure there to support them. Um, they could maybe find uh, fish in streams and game in the fields, but other staples like flour, butter, um, whiskey, coffee, tools, uh, manufactured goods, even tin plates, all of that had to be imported from elsewhere into the mining camps. None of it could be sourced locally, or at least not enough of it. And a group of merchants quickly sensed an opportunity from all this. There you have these isolated mining towns full of many thousands of, of men fueled with gold um, and this incredible pent-up demand. So the merchants established a pretty robust mercantile network uh, that connected these isolated mining settlements to towns like St. Louis and St. Joseph in Missouri, Nebraska City in Omaha and Nebraska, Denver and Colorado, and Salt Lake City in Utah. Uh, there was not yet uh, in the winter of 1863 to 64 a reliable enough steamboat operation um, to move all the freight necessary, so most of these merchants and freighters moved their cargo over land. So these new markets um, in the mining camps promised a great deal of opportunity for the merchants, but there was also a lot of danger in establishing that network. Uh, thinking about the, the land and the weather itself, that's enough to cause danger. In the winter, snow can cause cargo to get lost. It can cause passes to be blocked. In the spring, of course, on the plains, you can have pretty violent storms that can again damage cargo or cause it to be lost. And then there was the human element, too, that the merchants had to contend with. Um, they constantly, in their writings, talked about their fear of Native American, quote unquote, depredations, end quote. But it was really the depredations of their own countrymen that they had um, most often to fear. Uh, the Civil War was raging, and sometimes the, the freighters and the merchants might encounter plunder-hungry forces that were ostensibly engaged in the conflict. So one, the John Nye, a uh, merchant and soon-to-be vigilante, would complain bitterly in the fall of 1864 when, quote, the Kansas militia, who came up the road as far as there was no danger, ostensibly to fight the Indians and protect the road, developed their real purpose and showed out their real nature by making a regular raid as though they were in the enemy's country." End quote. 
his cargo having fallen victim to the militiamen, Nye went on to growl that, quote, he had as much need of protection from soldiers as he had from Indians, end quote. Similar attacks caused some merchants to adopt an armed posture and a siege mentality before they even reached Montana. Uh, one settler, Aaron T. Ford, who traveled into Montana by way of Nebraska with uh, merchant and future vigilante John Creighton, would note how careful Creighton was. Now he wouldn't even let his livestock go to water without multiple armed guards there to guard them. Now, if the merchants were willing to brave these risks, however, Montana did promise potentially massive profits. The miners who swelled in those settlements to, to produced an enormous demand for the supplies that could not be sourced locally, like butter, flour, tobacco, manufactured goods, and so on. Um, this meant that the merchants could and did sell their cargo at an extremely inflated price. Uh, one miner, Robert Kirkpatrick, noted that um, a dozen eggs in Montana went for the going price of a dollar. In Cincinnati, uh, the going price for a dozen eggs was only 20 cents. Uh, similarly, a pound of butter in Cincinnati was, cost 20 cents. Uh, in Montana, it cost uh, up to $1.25. Moments of scarcity made this price spiking even more extreme at times, with Kirkpatrick noting at one point that flour that cost $2.50 in Utah cost $20 in Bannock. Eventually, this inflation uh, caused so much resentment that in 1864 there would be flour riots directed against some of these merchants, including uh, merchant and vigilante John Creighton. Uh, but for the moment, uh, the miners continue to buy the goods at the inflated prices, and the merchants continue to profit. Um, sustained by gold or just hope, they continue to shell out money to the merchants. And with the lack of uh, familiar social institutions in Montana that might have existed elsewhere, um, the merchants also came to occupy a central role in the social life of these mining towns. Um, because the, they were settled so rapidly, uh, many of the institutions, uh, many of the miners who had been familiar with back home were simply not present in Montana. And so merchants provided distraction and diversion with, of course, famously saloons, grog halls, and dance houses where they would sell horrible whiskey of just uh, dangerous quality to the miners for about 25 cents a drink. Um, the merchants even came to dominate the Sabbath day, such was their sort of um, centrality in these mining towns and social world. Uh, there were no churches, priests, ministers, or uh, other religious figures yet established in the mining towns yet at the time, and so Sunday became the primary day for commerce and shopping. Um, one merchant, Thomas Conrad, who was a Roman Catholic, would write uh, letters to his wife expressing his guilt at keeping his own shop open on Sundays, uh, breaking the Sabbath day, but he explained that that's simply when the men shopped um, to sort of divert themselves. And he himself admitted that he too kept his shop open on Sundays because the profits were simply too great to refuse. <laughs> now, the merchants began to make quite a bit of money through this cycle. Um, of course, this started to lead to some resentment, especially through uh, the inflated prices. Some of the miners began to accuse the merchants of cheating them, either with unfairly weighted scales or with uh, plush carpets underneath those scales. They could collect the gold dust as it fell off um, and then scrape it off later. Uh, there, were, there are some remarks in the archival material about uh, miners complaining about cheating on behalf of the merchants. Um, and this led to an air of resentment. Now, when they were in the mining towns themselves, uh, the merchants didn't have too much to fear. They could defend their property fairly well from within the walls of their storehouses and their shops. Um, but their, their control and their ability to defend themselves and their property weakened along the isolated trails between settlements and into and out of the state. The dynamics of trading meant that merchants had to remain somewhat mobile. They had to be able to transport commodities both into the state as well as between settlements. Um, this environment now of minor resentment, inflated prices, and valuable caravans of trade goods and wealth made conditions ripe for banditry. So those highway bandits, commonly referred to as road agents, took advantage of uh, merchant vulnerability along the highways, ambushed them, and would steal uh, gold from them there. It was the merchants, however, who were attempting to depart Montana who made for the most vulnerable targets. Uh, you could make wealth in Montana as a merchant. You could make plenty of gold selling goods to the miners, but you really couldn't do anything with it while you were there. If you spent it, you'd be spending it on the same inflated prices that the other merchants were charging and you would just lose your money. Um, other than mining claims, there wasn't much to reinvest that wealth into. 
And so to make the investment worth it and to do really something productive with that gold, a successful merchant would now have to transport all of that wealth out of Montana to another trade hub in the States or to their home where they could reinvest it, get new cargo, or what have you. Um, but this means now that you have these merchants tend to leave on these isolated, dangerous roads just laden down with an incredible amount of gold wealth. Um, and for desperate, failed miners, banditry targeting these gold-laden travelers offered an opportunity to reverse poor fortunes um, or to simply accrue wealth. It got so bad that Mary Edgerton would write her sister in December of 1863 that, quote, it is not safe now for men to travel alone if they have too much money with them. There are too many robbers, end quote. She was not exaggerating. In October, Bandits killed a merchant Lloyd Magruder and stole several thousand dollars worth of gold dust after he left Virginia City. Over the following weeks, bandits robbed the Peabody and Caldwell stagecoach, the A.J. Oliver and Company stagecoach, and attempted to rob the wagons of freighter Milton S. Moody. Robbers also targeted merchant and butcher Conrad Kors and young Henry Tilden, who was an employee of both the lawyer Wilbur Fisk Sanders and Idaho Territory Chief Justice Sidney Edgerton. In December, it was the robbery and murder of Nicholas Tybalt, who was an employee of the merchant William Clark, that saw the capture of George Ives and his eventual execution on order of a miner's court. Um, the merchants had already been nervous about their operations before they entered into Montana, risky as they were. And so this string and sequence of increasingly bold robberies and killings drove them into a far deeper siege mentality. Now this brings us back to the night of December 20th, 1863 and that meeting in John Nye's store. That six of the eight men in that meeting were merchants is perhaps now not surprising. The primary objective of those men was to be able to protect their lives and their property as they attempted to leave Montana with the wealth that they had accrued in the territory. Combating lawlessness was only a tertiary motivation. Um, after all, the, uh, there was an unofficial legal system in, in the form of the miners' courts and it had successfully prosecuted George Ives but these merchants didn't want to sit around and wait on the slow and deliberative process of any kind of legal system, formal or not. They wanted decisive action that would send a message and allow them to resume transportation and uh, movement through this mercantile cycle. Uh, perhaps uh, the strongest evidence, though, that lawlessness was not one of their prime concerns of the vigilantes comes from Wilbur Fisk Sanders himself, who is, of course, a celebrated, uh, remembered vigilante leader. Sanders would admit in his later writings found at the archive that before the vigilante campaign commenced, uh, his soon-to-be victim, Henry Plummer, the sheriff, approached him asking Sanders to serve as his attorney. Now this wouldn't be a strange thing, but Plummer was asking Sanders to serve as his attorney in a crime he had not yet committed. Uh, <laughs> making matters worse, the crime was premeditated murder. Sanders relayed that Plummer had planned to assassinate one of his own deputies um, and wanted Sanders to represent him in the aftermath. Um, now, if, if lawlessness was really the concern of these men, one would expect Sanders to recoil at this sort of request, to recoil at this request to represent a man uh, who was still uh, planning a, a, a murder in cold blood. But uh, Sanders admitted that he egged Plummer on. He said, quote, I am afraid I encouraged him in this purpose, end quote. For men like Sanders and for the merchants who gathered in John Nye's dry goods store, lawlessness was not the prime concern. The primary motivator, above all else, was getting results and getting them quick. Still, no matter how badly this newly organized vigilance committee wanted to crush this road agent threat, killing is a difficult business. It's hard on a human level to take another human being's life, and it's even harder on an operational level to plan the sort of campaign that extinguishes 21 lives, and not just in an ethical way, if the vigilantes were sloppy or moved in a, in a sort of a poorly planned way, there was a chance their targets could have escaped, there was a good chance they could have organized and struck back, killing some of the vigilantes. Certainly in American history and other sorts of vigilante action, that sort of thing had happened, and uh, poorly planned vigilantes had lost their lives uh, to the men they themselves were trying to kill. So, how, then, did this group of primarily merchants manage to organize and orchestrate what was really a very ruthless and effective campaign of killing? Uh, indeed, one of the disservices, I think, of the vigilante legend to the vigilantes themselves is that it, it distracts from the difficulty and precision needed to perform this sort of operation. <laughs> 
So who then were the men uh, behind this unprecedented campaign of killing? Uh, Sanders would later claim that, quote, the scheme of the committee was planned with men wholly without experience as vigilantes, members of the Ku Klux Klan, or white caps, end quote. That's not true. Many of the men who formed the leadership in the core of the Vigilance Committee in the, in the winter of 1863 to 64 did have valuable experience in other incidents of extra legal collective violence uh, throughout the United States in the years prior to the vigilante movement in uh, Montana. Those men carried that experience with them and it helped inform the violence and uh, guide the men as they engaged in this campaign of killing. It's part of the reason why the campaign was so successful, because at moments of stress or fracture, the vigilantes could count on a number of men seasoned to this kind of violence who could guide and lead the action. We're going to talk about just a couple today. I'm sure there are more, uh, but these are the number that I've managed to identify uh, through the course of my research. We'll start in San Francisco. In San Francisco, there were two committees of vigilance, one in 1851 and 1856, in sort of a familiar cadence. Both of those vigilance committees were also led by merchants, and in both cases targeted and killed a number of men they identified as threats to their business enterprises. In 1851, the violence was directed against an alleged band of Australian criminals. In 1856, the vigilantes directed their violence against a group of supposedly corrupt Irish Catholic Democratic politicians. In both cases, uh, both incidents of violence led to a string of lynchings. One of the men who was involved in a pretty central way in Montana's Vigilance Committee claimed that he had been a part of one of these uh, San Franciscan Committees of Vigilance. He does not make clear which one, but that man was William Clark, who was the employer of that murdered young man, uh, Nicholas Tybalt, who had supposedly been killed by George Ives. Uh, one witness stated that, quote, or after Tybalt's disappearance, Clark declared that, quote, I helped organize the Vigilance Committee in California, and I am going to do the same here and I will make it hot for them before I die, end quote. Uh, Clark helped lead several arrests, and importantly, he was also the one who led the posse in drawing up written accusations against their targets in Lot's store. That move, of course, carried no legal validity, but it did reflect an older vigilante practice in the United States of pantomiming the formal legal system through this kind of action, thus giving a sort of sense of validity or justification to the vigilante's moves. Um, perhaps most importantly, though, Clark was a stable and veteran presence at moments of stress and was able to help direct some of the perhaps greener vigilantes um, during uh, very stressful arrests or moments of violence. But of course, he was not the only vigilante with prior experience in bloodletting. Another would be John A. Creighton, who, like me, comes from Omaha, Nebraska. In Omaha, John Creighton had been a member of a shadowy organization known as the Omaha Claim Club. So in Omaha, when uh, white settlers first, first pushed into the area, the federal government had not yet established a land office to be able to handle and process claims and disputes over claims. And so settlers formed this extra legal organization, the Omaha Claim Club, uh, to do so on paper. In reality, the Omaha Claim Club was a violent organization that used threats, intimidation, and, uh, and pretty extreme violence to advance the speculatory interests of some of the club's uh, leading members. Later court testimony that made it all the way to the Supreme Court reveals that not only was John Creighton a member of this organization, but he was one of its violent enforcers. That testimony reveals that Creighton and some of his relatives had at least on one occasion uh, used firearms to arrest a club target. And one did not want to be a club target of the Omaha Claim Club. The, the preferred uh, mode of torture used by the Claim Club was to take their victims to the frozen banks of the Missouri River where they would repeatedly hold them under the water until they either drowned or uh, acquiesced to the club's demands. One Omaha settler, John N. Smith, would testify simply that, quote, it is not considered safe to incur the, dis incur the displeasure in any way of the said Omaha City Claim Club, end quote. Now, Creighton was not, he did not have the Masonic connections of a lot of the other men who formed the initial core of the Vigilance Committee. Uh, he was a Roman Catholic. But this sort of violent experience, again, uh, lent an important um, veteran presence to proceedings, and that alone can be enough to inspire trust. And it's probably why he was included in the group of eight men who met in John Nye's store on December 20th. We have another node of violence in Kansas, where two other pretty well-known vigilantes, uh, John X. Beadler and James Williams, uh, were both fighters in the anti-slavery free state cause there in the state. 
Uh, Beedler allegedly fought at the Battle of Hickory Point um, and was potentially wounded at fighting near Osawatomie. According to James Williams' son, who had left some writings here at the Historical Society, Williams took uh, a leadership role among uh, anti-slavery guerrillas and led men in combat. Their participation in this brutal and violent episode of, of um, a bloodletting in Kansas seemed to have a pretty profound effect on both men, um, leading to a willingness to kill that even other vigilantes in Montana remarked upon. Um, uh, Sanders himself would note, uh, in reference to James Williams and killing, that, quote, at all times, when others shrank away from the task, he would put the halter around the neck of the victim with absolute coolness. And I think it might be said that he performed this unwelcome duty with greater frequency than any other man, although ex Beadler was a close second, end quote. So as you can see, participation in the violence of Bleeding Kansas had left this mark on these two men, uh, leading to that elevated willingness to kill that was remarked upon by even other vigilantes, and thus influenced the form uh, of the violence as it unfolded in Montana itself. A little later and further to the rest in Denver, another group of future Montana vigilantes were present in Denver during the reign of that city's own secretive committee of vigilance between 1859 and 1861. In another familiar cadence, uh, the federal government had not yet established a robust enough legal system in the city, and so there was a, a rash of theft, killing, and other property rights violations. In reaction, a group of settlers formed a committee of vigilance, carried out a string of lynchings, and then uh, retreated again. Denver's vigilantes were better than most at actually keeping their operations secret, and uh, as far as I can tell, never made public their identities, although uh, many early settlers remarked upon who was believed to be the leaders of that organization. Some, um, maybe not surprisingly, had been members of the Omaha Claim Club prior, so we can maybe see these webs of violence as they twist and tangle um, throughout this history, but they included the likes of William N. Byers, Alexander C. Hunt, William Larimer, and John Shivington, who would later perpetrate the Sand Creek Massacre. Now, many of the men, or at least several of the men, who would later take important and prominent roles in Montana's vigilantes, uh, were in close networked uh, connection with these supposed leaders of Denver's vigilante committee. Both Paris Fouts, who would be the president of the vigilance committee, as well as uh, John Nye were involved in Masonic circles in Denver. And if one uh, even reads the paper, you can see their names appear alongside uh, the supposed uh, executive committee of Denver's Vigilance Committee. So I believe it's likely that these men probably um, did serve in Denver's Committee of Vigilance, as you can see from later uh, remarkable cohesion between Denver and Montana vigilantes when the Montanans uh, chased one of their targets who escaped into Colorado. Um, but certainly, at the very least, they associated tightly with these men and perhaps learned a great deal of how to organize and operate and orchestrate this sort of vigilante campaign. Uh, others, including James Williams, John S. Lott, and X. Beadler, were present. And although they, they, they did not have the same intimate Masonic connections as Fouts and Nye did, they were there and able to witness how a successful vigilance committee was able to operate in this setting um, and do so successfully. All these experiences really shaped the form and the flow of vigilantism in Montana. And undoubtedly, they played a critical part in the campaign's success. We must not view the, the campaign of violence in 1863 to 64 Montana as sort of an isolated affair or through a romanticized lens. To do so would be to lose sight of the actual mechanics of the violence. Instead, to have a better understanding of Montana's vigilantes and the violence they performed, you need to analyze the human element of that vigilance committee. It is to understand the mercantile interests that motivated many of the merchants and freighters to engage in this campaign of killing. It is also to spy the connections and the past experiences that would shape the form of the violence and allow the vigilantes to move against their targets with deadly efficiency. In a broader sense, this sort of approach locates the vigilantism with a, within a larger striking con constellation of violent actions bound across space and time. To see the violence in this way is to make visible the hi hidden genealogies behind episodes of violence and is a chance to better understand the very mechanics by which such violence is reproduced. The story of the Montana vigilantes is key to this larger story. Thank you very much.
Awesome. Got a couple. Could you touch on the uh, 7777 uh, theme of the vigilantes? Unfortunately, I can't. They, they started using that uh, sort of symbol after the 1863 to 64 movement. Um, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't see much about that in the archives as I studied this exact episode. I know there are several theories about, I don't think any of them have been conclusively proven yet. If it falls within the range of your knowledge or research, could you say a few words about how some young men were able to avoid military activity during the Civil War and maybe can compare that to 20th century conscription? <laughs> sure. He asked about how some young men were able to escape uh, conscription to the Civil War and how maybe that compares with 20th century efforts at conscription. And I'm not an expert on, on military history of the 20th century, so I'm less confident in answering that part of the question. But I can certainly speak to how these young men were able to avoid conscription in the Civil War era. Um, in fact, the uh, Territorial governors of certain regions, like Colorado, simply used the threat of uh, conscription to uh, chase unwanted itinerant young men out of their territory. Um, that's how a lot of Coloradans ended up in Montana, is that rumors began to spread that the, the territorial governor there was going to forcibly conscript them into the Union cause. And because many of those men were from Missouri, they recoiled at that and pushed further north into Montana, which is why I think in the writings you see um, a lot of miners espousing sort of uh, very prominent uh, pro-Southern views. Um, but really they just, they just ran and they moved. Conscription was not as uh, elegant as it maybe is today or as well regulated. So they could simply move out of territories in which they thought they might be pressed into service and uh, make their way north where they knew that the federal government couldn't reach them. Thank you. Of course. Uh, I uh, appreciate your, your um, talking about the Masonic connection. I've often, when I have been looked at the Virginia City uh, vigilante situation, have thought that most of the vigilantes were Union men. A lot of Confederates were up there mining gold in Alder Gulch. And I, uh, some, not all, but almost all of the, um, the targets of the vigilantes were Confederates, uh, but not all of them. But a, a, large, a large portion of them. Have you ever looked at that connection? I have, and there's actually one letter in the archive by a, a Union League member, a, a Unionist, who does celebrate this campaign of killings as this great triumph over Democrats and triumph for the Unionist cause. But if you look into the backgrounds of some of the men who formed the core of the Vigilance Committee, um, I, I'm not sure if we can really ascribe their motivations to any sort of political leanings. Uh, Paris S. Fouts was pro-secession, even though he was from the North. Um, he was a a Democrat, John Creighton was also a Democrat. Uh, Nicholas Wall had actually been a Confederate who was uh, captured and paroled and came to Montana. And so while you do have very prominent abolitionists and Republicans like Wilbur Fisk Sanders and others in the vigilante movement, and perhaps uh, overrepresentative from the larger community, uh, they also included in their ranks fairly prominent Democrats. And, and Paris Fouts was the president of the executive committee, so they, they let them have uh, roles of, of power within the organization. So. Uh, really, I think this is primarily about uh, the mercantile interests of the merchants. They're able to put those other disagreements, at least for the moment, to the side. Thank you. Kind of a related question. Um, you, you mentioned in the San Francisco instance that the, uh, uh, the targets were identified in one case as Australians and in another case Irish Catholics or something like that. So are there any hints that there were other set, setting the the conflict between the North and the South aside, any hints that uh, the vigilantes in Virginia City identified some other kind of ethnic or religious character to their targets? Um, I don't think so. Uh, there, were, there were Protestants and Catholics and Masons all represented within the, the Vigilance Committee. There were Anglo-Americans, there were um, Irish-Americans. Of course, the, the killing of Jose Pizanthia in Bannock is probably the most extreme killing you see during this vigilante movement. So certainly uh, anti-Mexican prejudice played a role in the fact that the vigilantes and the mob that forms around that killing uh, desecrate the body in a way they don't do with any of the white victims. So that's probably the, the biggest example I can think of of any kind of uh, ethnic or racial uh, 
um, biases fueling this. But in general, um, the vigilantes were uh, m more concerned about uh, a threat to their transit and cargo than they were concerned about um, other types of social control or ethnic division or even religious divides. But thank you, that's a good question. They're all named. Um, I didn't want to go through the list of 21 names today. Uh, often the vigilantes or the people that left accounts of it. Um, but I, I think their killings are fairly well documented. Um, what I wonder, of course, is that there were there additional killings that weren't documented? And did the number really stop at 21? The vigilantes got kind of carried away, I think, at a certain point. And I do think they killed a couple people that were certainly innocent. Um, but who knows if, if all of that killing was, was documented, especially in the sort of uh, sanitized accounts that followed the, the violence. Great job this morning. Uh, Thank you. Well researched. What was that aha moment in the archives when you found the source that just made a researcher's day or year? Wilbur Fisk Sanders was, uh, he left a lot of papers behind and I think he was delving into his file because he took the time to really, to write out who all was connected to this. Um, how things got underway. And I, I think that that was really the moment where I was like, wow, there's something really deep here um, beyond just one or two connections, and I really want to sink my teeth into it more. Thank you for the question. It was just curious <coughs> uh, if they were trying to stop future uh, raids and road agents, did they make the killings public or lynchings? Or how did they carry it out? Just one at a time, or was it over a number of years? Or? It was within the span of just a few weeks. Uh, some of them were not public, but many were. And so one of the key aspects of vigilantism typically is that it's meant to send a message above all else. Right. You can't really eliminate every bad person, even with such a large campaign of violence that kills 21 lives. Um, overall, the, the prime objective is to, to communicate to this broader population that, that such activity is not acceptable and we're going to respond uh, with incredible violence if it continues to happen. So it's to strike fear into the larger population. And that goes not just for Montana, but for vigilante movements throughout American history. So I was just curious how they communicated that by making, I assume, public. Yeah, they, they hang a plumber, for instance, on the, the gallows that he himself erected uh, in Bannock. So some of those were very public executions where a great crowd gathered. And then, of course, news would spread that, uh, can you believe they killed the sheriff? You know, so. Um, they, they certainly knew what they were doing and they weren't killing these people in the dead of the night with bandanas on. It was very public, it was orchestrated, um, and it was meant to, to send a very clear message. There's two of you with your hands up. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> um, in your work, you know, you're obviously looking at the, the background of violence and all of these men, did you also look into background of violence of the road agents, specifically plumber, for one. I looked a little bit into plumber. I think that is a, a whole other really rich vein of research that requires its own uh, topic. Plumber was in and around California while vigilance committees and vigilantes were active there. And I think it's pretty obvious that because of his own personal experience that he had a deep and profound distrust of vigilantes and vigilance committees. I don't think that means he was necessarily guilty. Um, I think a lot of the miners from California, and Sanders admits to this, are, were, were cautious about vigilance committees and hostile to them because they were not fans of how, the, how things had gone in San Francisco. Um, so some of the ways Plummer, I think, acts in, uh, around like the George Ives murder where he's panicking and, and assigning pickets to the hills around Bannock, that might reflect just his own personal experience in California <coughs> and may not be conclusive proof that he knew he was guilty and that he knew he was going to die. Um, but uh, I, ha I need to do more research in that, or someone else does. It's a fascinating topic. Which would explain why you would hire an attorney before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Before he escaped from jail in Carson City. Exactly. He almost died there, yeah. And I, I know you've been raising your hand. Yeah, um, the focus of your excellent presentation is oh, thank you. on this organized violence by the vigilance committee. Did, did you run across any evidence that uh, those merchants also tried to organize uh, ways to transport gold out and new supplies in, in an organized way, like wagon trains that would 
to be better at defending themselves against the other? That's a good question. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, maybe they, they're still in competition, so maybe they only wanted their cooperation to extend to this, this uh, uh, communicative campaign of violence, uh, show that the merchant class is not going to brook such threats. But I, I haven't seen a ton of cooperation outside of that in the actual transit of goods. I do know that they, they did have uh, guards, at least like Creighton did, um, but I can't see that they traveled in, in big caravans to protect themselves, although that would have made sense to do. That's a, he was asking if, uh, from the research if I uh, believe that the 21 uh, targets of the Vigilance Committee were really guilty of, of banditry and being bona fide road agents. And the answer is I don't know. And it's hard to tell after all these years and after the, the narrative of the violence has been sort of uh, so covered with this, this legendary sort of narrative. I, I believe that some probably were. I would, I would hazard to say that I don't think all were guilty. Um, for example, the killing of Slade, I think, um, by the vigilantes was more about showing that they were in control than uh, really any of Slade's own uh, crimes. So I, I do think that at a certain point they got carried away and realized that they were so heavily invested they had to just keep uh, killing at a certain point to maintain control and prevent uh, the situation from deteriorating in their point of view. Um, but it's difficult to determine just who was and who wasn't guilty. I'm sure the, the debate over Plummer's innocence and guilt will continue to rage on for, for decades to come. I don't know if we're, we'll ever be able to answer it in a conclusive way. But thank you. Yeah, she was asking uh, about the future of these men and if, if they ever reflected on the violence and uh, maybe regretted their actions or if they always portrayed it as sort of uh, the right and just thing to do. And I think overwhelmingly, at least publicly, most of them do talk about how justified it was, how necessary it was. I haven't come across any vigilante who laments um, the fact that they were involved in this campaign of killing um, I know some did have tortured lives afterwards. I think James Williams eventually commits suicide. Uh, that might be due to the trauma from, from Kansas, from this, from any other um, uh, mental um, um, hardships or experiences. Um, Sanders is a complicated person specifically, um, but he doesn't ever go so far as to say he regrets his participation in the Vigilance Committee. But that's a really good question. And more research should be done on that, the, the past, the future lives of these men. There is a connection between Creighton and the university. Um, and that's probably, uh, the, so this question was how well some of these merchants prospered afterwards. Um, it's varied, a lot of the merchants uh, did do quite well. Creighton, probably the most famous example, he went back uh, to Omaha and with his, his incredible wealth, he does found Creighton University there in Omaha, which bears his family name to this day. Um, they're like the Creighton Blue Jays. I think they should change their mascot to the Freight and Creightons to kind of, <laughs> do some homage to that legacy. Um, but I think Creighton is the, the, probably the best example of one of the merchants who emerged from this um, incredibly successful. Thank you. Sanders. Yeah, Sanders too. Any other questions? Well, uh, legend has it that uh, Plummer and his gang, which he, I guess were called the Innocents, Robber's roots. Uh, did you find any evidence of any such meetings in your research? I, I found no direct evidence other than rumors. Uh, the vigilantes themselves weren't really uh, certain of how the, the bandits specifically operated before they launched this campaign. Um, in many ways, they went into it dark and just kind of pushed forward, and it was through uh, interrogations of men that they captured that they. they they claimed or believed that other men were associated with this supposed band of, of road agents. 
Um, but I can't find any conclusive evidence, or at least I haven't stumbled upon it, from the period indicating um, more concretely how the, the band is actually operated. And even if they were an organized band, or if they were just a loose collection of bandits that the vigilantes deemed an organized group later on. I have uh, uh, Lane Skinner Hale. I, um, one of my relatives was a barkeeper in Bannock named Skinner. I think I read his papers. A lot of, of the, uh, the, the vigil or the uh, road agents, the plumber gang, and he was hanged. That's really yeah. Yeah. Because he was just associated with that group yeah. and. And so that, that speaks to the earlier question, too, about who's all guilty. It's hard to know. The vigilantes are operating in this, this climate of confusion and threat and uncertainty. And so one has to wonder who all is truly guilty and who is simply guilty by association. Yeah. Yeah. We're out of time. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you.